There are over two billion acres of desolate, salty wasteland across the planet. What if I told you that this could be turned into productive agriculture without using a single drop of fresh water? Well, we can. By searching the world for rare plants that can grow in salt water, an entirely new form of agriculture, unlocking the endless supply of ocean waters being developed, including this 4,500 acre site in Southern Spain. Thanks for meeting me, Yannick. I've been super fascinated by this concept of regenerative seawater agriculture. This sounds like something out of a science fiction utopia. I want to learn exactly how this works. So behind us, this looks like a salt marsh, but it's also a farmed and engineered salt marsh with virtually the two most abundant resources in the world, degraded land and salt water, what we call saline agroecology. So combining the restoration and building of ecosystems with farming them. So what's the secret to getting food to grow in salt water? The vast majority of crops that we eat and use commercially, they can't survive in salt. Most plants can't, but there's over 3,000 different species of plants that can grow in salt water. And these are called halophytes. And the reason why they can is that over millennia, they've evolved to be able to either process the salt or actually prevent the salt from coming into the membranes. What's great about this plant and a lot of these perennial halophytes is at each level, you have a different commercial value. So in the carbon and the roots, you can sell that as carbon credits. Then you have these long woody stems that make an excellent building material like a fiber board that can be used as an animal feed. And then you have the, the green tips at the, at the top that's a high valley vegetable or an animal feed. So at the very tips where the seeds are produced, that's a really high valley cooking oil and even a biofuel. We're using conventional agricultural technology and equipment. So tractors and harvesters that are retrofitted to be able to access waterlogged and marshy terrain. We're regularly seeing yields per year per hectare of over 30 tons. So when you compare that to barley or wheat, where it's five, six, seven tons per hectare per year, there's a bit more water content in this biomass, but that's many times more. We've grown these halophytes in some of the harshest conditions where nothing else can survive. Sometimes they are completely flooded. Sometimes of the year they're in extremely dry soil. And the resilience of these species is not because of genetic modification or breeding. These are natural plants. When you look at them closely, you see that they are succulents. So they're actively storing a lot of water and moisture. These are multi-year, deep-rooted plants. They grow and they survive for decades. So they're soil builders and are really prolific biomass producers. Because they're perennial, we're able to cut the top of the biomass three or four times a year. And it doesn't affect the plant, doesn't harm the plant. The roots keep growing and capturing carbon. And we're able to extract sustainably from that without having to ever plow the fields or till the land or do anything to the soil. We don't use fertilizers or pesticides because the salt water is a natural fertilizer and a pesticide. Seawater is some of the most nutrient dense fertilizer you can imagine and you know, it's free and it's just flowing onto our site. So there are hardly any inputs here. It makes our job as farmers extremely easy. By using seawater, they have unlocked an infinite resource. Fresh water is the most limiting element to agriculture around the planet. But this type of agriculture that runs on salt water completely eliminates the needs for fresh water while producing perennial yields. So we are here in the Guadalquivir River Delta. This is a broad lowland basin. Most of this ground is within a meter of sea level. So there's a lot of salt water coming in from the ocean to a wide expanse. There's so much land here in which this new form of agriculture could be implemented. So Yannick and his team have been massively expanding their project. We drove to their latest development site to see how a system like this gets established and all the technical details of how the water system functions. Welcome to our site called the Marismas de Trebujena, which is the marshes of Trebujena, where the river meets the sea. Well, you got a lot of work going on here. Yeah, it's the finishing touches to this project, which is a couple hundred hectares. Usually we try to minimize infrastructure, try to make things as cost effective and as cheap as possible. In this case, this is a multi-million euro project that involves a lot of different stakeholders, a lot of government funding. So it's a landmark project for marsh restoration in Europe, really. 
I can't believe that we came at such an awesome time to see what this thing looks like before it becomes filled with plants. In six months time, this is gonna be green, quite a healthy ecosystem. We're already seeing the flamingos in these lagoons that have just filled up like in the last couple of weeks. So the biodiversity increase here is gonna be a thousand percent easily within the next 12 months. This is like a terraformer's dream where you've got infinite water to create the most incredible dynamic that you can. There's an intricate system of water infrastructure of canals and rivers that manage how much salt water come into the site at any given time. This is where it all starts, where all the water comes from. We have our sluice gates here that can be open and closed, and this is really where we are able to control the ecosystem from the water input point. This one control point can feed the entire 600 hectare site. Yeah, it can flood actually a lot more than that. The over 15,000 hectares behind that that could also be transitioned into this type of saline agroecology. This is the most important part of the site. It's where all the nutrients, all the fish, all the plant biomass, all the seeds, everything comes from the river and the estuary and the sea. So it's like basically you're just taking the seawater and you're just spreading it out across this marshy area, kind of concentrating these canals and that's it. Yeah, that's it. We don't have to sow seeds or plant or do anything really. The water does all the work for us and that's where it comes in right here. Amazing. So this is how it opens. Really, really simple. This is the back end of the main inlet canal. These are called smart gates and they're really simple in many ways, but basically the momentum of the water by the high tides is pushing open the flap on this side. And then when the tide goes out, the momentum comes from the other side, pushing the gate closed. So it's keeping the water in, and then when the tide comes in again, opens again. So there's nothing we have to do, really. It just regulates itself, making sure that as much water as possible stays in there at all times. So it's basically tidal-powered irrigation. Tidal-powered irrigation, yep. Only one of them is open today. When all three of them are open, it's a massive volume of water that is then flooding the land. We're standing right now in our main feeder canal. So this river that's been engineered and constructed feeds the entire area with water tidally. So this is a massive 20 meter wide canal. This is over 18,000 liters per second that's coming through those gates. So this is a flood that happens across this vast area of land. Every time the tide comes in. Every time the tide comes in, yeah. This is a natural park as well as a public park, as well as a biodiversity hub and agriculture. It's combining all these different things into one area. This is a much more engineered version of what we'd usually do. So there's a lot more water infrastructure here, canals tying into these lagoon infrastructures to support really rare and endangered bird species like Atlantic ducks, flamingos, and all kinds of biodiversity. The ecological significance of restoring coastal wetlands worldwide can't be understated. When we look at bird migration routes across the globe, their routes fly over river deltas, coastal wetlands, and inland lakes. Through enhancing the habitat for birds, these agricultural restoration projects weave together many ecosystems of the planet. We see this clearly in the Guadalquivir River Delta. The Guadalquivir marshes are very important, not just for the breeding birds that are coming from South Africa or from Namibia, Mauritania, or Senegal, spending their winter in Africa and come back to breed here. It's very important also for wintering of a lot of species of birds, cranes, black storks or ospreys even, that are breeding in the north of Europe and spend their winter time here with us. It's a key habitat for every bird that flies over the world. You know, I was a little bit skeptical because estuaries are really delicate ecosystems and we think about converting that to farmland, it seems like it could be really destructive. But this place is so diverse, it is teeming with wildlife. There are so many different species of birds, flocks of flamingos, pelicans, pollinators of all types and all of these different flowers here, butterflies and caterpillars. This is an incredibly rich wildlife area. It turns out the work in Spain's coastal wetlands is just the beginning because the salinization of land around the world is a major issue that most people don't even know about. Low-lying coastal wetlands are getting saltier as sea levels rise. 
More and more of the world's farmlands becoming too salty to grow regular crops because of bad agricultural practices like over-irrigation. And many deserts have very little rain and the underground aquifers that do exist are salted because of the natural geology. Over 900 million hectares of land globally, more than a third of our agricultural land has become salt affected. And that obviously impacts the potential to grow food and generally food security. Africa has its own unique geography and saline agriculture is being used to restore land and even grow food on landscapes that were thought to be destroyed and completely unusable. There are literally oceans of salt water underneath the ground. Communities and governments and NGOs and private individuals are spending a lot of money drilling boreholes to get out fresh water for drinking or for their livestock and out comes salt water. And what we're doing is we're repurposing that water infrastructure to use that salt water to create these salt marsh or mangrove agroecologies. Mangroves are trees that actually grow in salt water on the coastlines in the tropics. We are restoring mangrove forests, but also creating mangrove agroforestry. So that's an intentional cultivation and forestry system of mangroves for timber, for various textile products, for animal feed. Regenerative seawater agricultural systems are based off of this keystone species of mangroves. So the mangroves are a gateway to creating a productive aquaculture system and taking these deltas and actually turning them even more into rich food producing areas. You can see this tangle of roots and stems they buffer storm surge. Imagine this mangrove forest is this natural shock absorber that can absorb the force of a storm surge and disperse that force so it doesn't make a, a violent landfall. There's no reason why the tropical coastal areas of the world, and especially deltas, shouldn't be entirely vegetated with these mangrove-based ecosystems. Around the world, you have tens of millions of hectares of existing or degraded coastal wetlands, and then over 900 million hectares of degraded land inland that's salt affected. That can be transitioned and terraformed into new farmland just using salt. The great thing about an integrated approach like this is that there is no compromise to be made between food production or nature or biodiversity. This is coexisting in one area where one actually actively feeds the other. It is really special to see agriculture and nature in harmony. This is agriculture that is actually enhancing the natural system and feeding people at the same time. This has the potential to be one of the most important innovations in agriculture in modern history. It's as if a whole new part of the planet just opened up for farming. This changes everything. Are you ready to transform deserts, create lush backyards, and feed communities? In my almost 30 years as a permaculture designer traveling the world, I've put everything I learned into Oregon State University's online permaculture design course, or PDC. The PDC and PDC Pro are the ultimate ways to begin mastering permaculture. Me and my team guide you through over 20 assignments with more than 100 hours of top quality video lectures and resources, all focused on developing your own property or project throughout the course. You'll get personalized feedback from a dedicated instructor in a small group setting. People are always asking me, how can I be part of the solution? This is your starting point. Check the link below for upcoming courses and join us in creating a better world for everyone. See you in class.